What's up everybody? How you doing? Welcome to episode four of my story and this episode is called When Things Started to Escalate. Hold on for the ride. Enjoy. So at the end of episode three, uh, we got to the point where I'd just been offered um, this incredible position as the snow sports community manager for a youth snow sports charity, Snow Camp. And as you can imagine, um, I was delighted to be offered the position and it really felt like I'd arrived and everything in my life at that point had been leading up to uh, this new position that I've been blessed with. And I remember from day one, um, you know, this energy was just pumping through me about the impact that I could possibly have for this charity, you know, all these different fundraising events and the ways we're going to bring our community together and raise a ton of cash to change the lives of inner city young people with the power of snow sports. It's an amazing position, but uh, you know, throughout January, February, March, April, May, June, uh, my energy and my ideas and the dopamine and adrenaline was just vamping up to another level and I stopped looking after myself, you know, I wasn't sleeping or eating very well, you know, um, I just started having all these ideas and thinking, wow, if I can have this impact for the charity, imagine the impact that I could have for the UK. And if I was going to go that far, why not the world, you know, and I've always had this gut sense of that there's so much suffering, unnecessary suffering going on in the world and I think you guys have got the sense of, you know, it means so much to me to try and ease that suffering, you know, as best as I can with all the time I have on this planet and, you know, that, that energy and that feeling was just vamping up to another level throughout the first half of 2012 and um, I couldn't turn off this high, you know, and it was going up and up and up and up and my foot was getting planted on the accelerator using the F1 analogy. And, you know, everybody was trying to tell me just to slow down, you know, Dan, just try and rest properly and eat well. And I just wasn't, you know, I, I genuinely felt that, you know, spending two hours in the kitchen making a nutritious meal was a waste of time because people are suffering right now and I want to do something about it. And, you know, there, there were periods throughout sort of May and June, early May and June, where I went for basically three weeks straight, having two hours of sleep a night, and it was ridiculous. You know, I just was not looking after myself whatsoever. So anyway, we booked this holiday to Italy in June 2012, and everybody was saying, Dan, just turn off your phone, just relax, just go out there and switch off. You know, just go and switch off with my fiance, Georgie, who's now my wife. Oh my God, how lucky am I? And, uh, so we're flying out to Italy and um, at that point, you know, my energy was on a different level and I started believing I was the next Mark Zuckerberg and the next Steve Jobs. And it wasn't long before I started believing basically that I was the chosen one. And I was sent here to show the world how to slow down and follow their hearts. And so, you know, even at the airport, I was going up to people saying that I wanted them on my team. Um, you know, I was going to change the world. and you know, I wanted them to be a part of it. And you know, when we got to the hotel, it was a really rustic, um, half developed hotel. And you could tell that the family were really trying to, you know, put their heart and soul into the place. And by that point, you know, I, uh, you know, I genuinely believed that I had all the wealth in the world, both in time and money, which of course I didn't have. And so I basically made them a promise that I'd help them develop the rest of the hotel. And I started giving away all my possessions. And I bought a bottle of wine for every single room in this hotel that we were staying with, um, with money that I didn't really have. And obviously the alarm bells are going off. So, uh, you know, Georgie calls my family, uh, my mother and her mother, and get this, they start arranging coming out to be with us because something wasn't right. And so, you know, they're both, they both start making arrangements to be with us. And the number one priority at that point was to get me to a psychiatric hospital. And at that point, I was happy to go along with anything because I felt like the world was about to change for the better. It didn't matter, matter where I was, I could have an impact from anywhere. So anyway, this uh, specialist psychiatric ward was about an hour and a half drive away. And I was the only one insured on our little Fiat 500 that we had. And so we're driving along um, for a good sort of half an hour. And, you know, this sense of wanting to help the world right now in the biggest way I possibly could was blowing up and blowing up. And if I didn't get it out of my system, I was gonna explode. So we pull over on the hard shoulder, I scramble out the car, I'm walking down the hard shoulder, it's basically taking off all my clothes down to my khaki shorts. And I started bitting my hands up, you know, 
to the slow lane and then the middle lane and the fast lane and I was stood in my khaki shorts at 5pm at rush hour in the middle of a major motorway in northern Italy and I'd stopped the traffic and I backed it up for a good sort of like five miles and I started letting one car go at a time as this massive demonstration to show the world how to slow down and follow their hearts and the irony is is that I was going at 200 miles an hour how crazy is that so anyway I let one car go at a time and you know it wasn't long before the ambulance team was there and the police officers and everybody was like you know what's this guy on you know has he, has he been smoking anything or drugs and you know nobody had the answers you know we you know like just people around me Georgie they just didn't know what the hell was going on you know and for me I felt like I was on cloud nine so you know I was really trying to convince these police officers that they were going to be my head of security and you know the, the ambulance team that they were going to be my chief medical officers and you know I was just, just sending it with all this conviction and dopamine and as you can tell it's pretty catastrophic and really destructive for anybody around me so anyway they pin me down in the back of the ambulance and they get me to the uh, to the hospital and they strap me down on a bed and start pumping me full of these drugs that would sedate a sumo wrestler because that's what I needed at the time just to make me slow down and eat and sleep and eat and sleep and I was just being pumped full of these drugs full of them and it was a really confusing time because I kept waking up and you know I had 100% conviction in every atom of my being and I genuinely believed I was the chosen one and then I started waking up thinking well you know now what's going on I'm in this hospital and I'm I'm being pumped full of drugs you know and it was really confusing and you know obviously there were other people on the, on the ward as well and you know I was just like is it is this where I'm supposed to be you know is this what's going on um, and so it was a really confusing time for the you know the two weeks that we spent on the ward in Italy and you know I had my family with me there the whole time it was just amazing so anyway two British nurses fly out from the British Embassy and they fly me back to the UK and they get me uh, in a escorted uh, ambulance vehicle again and get me to the Maudsley Hospital in South London in Denmark Hill and it was definitely the best place for me but I've got to share it was a pretty horrific experience in the sense that it was a disgusting facility I've got to say during the time that I was there it was pretty dire and this is supposed to be one of the best mental health institutions in the country and fortunately out of the you know 15 or so staff on that ward there was one particular uh, male nurse called Dale and he just treated me like his little brother you know and validated that I wasn't crazy and these things can happen to anybody and he was a true hero and um, I just wish I could make contact with him again now but we're gonna have to see uh, so anyway you know like two days before I was discharged it was clear that I was going to get the diagnosis of bipolar disorder and um, I've got to share actually all my friends and family like some amazingly close friends and family came and visited me pretty much every day in the ward as well which is unbelievable so anyway I get discharged I'm at home and then the depression starts to kick in and it was terrible and I basically spent the back end of uh, 2012 wanting to kill myself and I just didn't want to be here you know because I went from having a hundred percent conviction in myself every atom of my being to having zero conviction in myself and not trusting my thoughts anymore and not trusting any word that left my lips and it was hard guys it was really hard and uh, the medication was was not quite right and you know my mood was fluctuating and basically I was pinned down to my bed I couldn't get up and uh, you know there were periods for over six weeks where you know I only got out of bed at about 5 p.m. just out of guilt because our housemates were coming home and Georgie was coming home and I guilt trips myself into getting up and looking like at least I had some sort of nor normal day um, but you know the, the two meter walk to the bathroom to brush my teeth was it was like climbing Everest it was really tough it was really tough but but I'm very very fortunate in that I've got an incredible incredible dream team around me I've got the world's best family I've got the world's best mates 
and they had my back. And as well as them, I had a true lifesaver with a care coordinator called Grace Parkin. And I've got to tell you, if she wasn't here, I'm not sure I would be here right now saying these words because she genuinely saved my life through talking. And so twice a week to begin with and then once a week as the year progressed, I had talking therapy with Grace. And she stopped me from taking my own life. And if you're wondering, I got to the point basically where I'd put my trainers on to go and suss out the place where I was going to take my life. But fortunately I didn't um, because of Grace and my family and my amazing friends. But it was a tough time. It was a really tough time. And if I wasn't in a state of limbo, I was in a catastrophic state of depression. And uh, I think I'm gonna leave this episode here because what was to come, as you now know, is a very positive and progressive journey back to the place that you find me in today. And so episode five, it will be coming to you shortly and we're gonna call that one The Road to Recovery. How does that sound? I love you guys. Thank you for the support. And I'll check back in soon. Lots of love. <laughs>